welcome to the Make It a Great Day movement and the Suicide Prevention Show. We are making suicide a thing of the past, and we are so grateful that you are here. And here I am, ta-da! I'm super happy that you could join us. This is the most fun you could possibly have, and this one you get to geek out on. All right, get ready to geek out. Here we go. We are going to geek out into a brand new world. It is a new language. The language is going to take us behind the scenes of what helped Michelle on this topic about anxiousness and anxiety and her family. And she's going to share her story. And then we're going to go into something that's really fun. So now, without further ado, <laughs> Let's welcome Michelle into the room. All right, there we go. <laughs> Hi. Hey, I can see you and I can hear you and so can everybody else, I hope. So, hey everybody, go to the chat box. Let us know that you can see us and hear us because we're not going anywhere until we know for sure. There we go, all good. Excellent. Yeah. So, so glad to be with you today. I am super happy that you are here with me today. Ah, so you brought a fan club with you, I know. I mean, because what you're doing in the world is starting to attract a lot of attention. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> and yes. I have been deliberately obtuse. I have not talked about what it is. So, ah. so I figured that we would just start the conversation with where did this all begin? Because Michelle, you have a name in some <clears throat> very, very high echelon circles if people are familiar with athletics. Yes. And for the rest of us, yeah, who are you? Tell me all this. Tell me the story of Michelle. I want to know. I want to know. Take us into the world according to Michelle. All right. Well, way back in the day, I was uh, an athlete. I actually grew up in multiple sports, something that is not very common today. And it wasn't until I was in my teens that I started speed skating, which was a new sport to Calgary because we had the Olympics coming a few years following, but was, you know, the Olympic oval was just being built. It was a new foreign sport. One thing led to another. I tried the sport and I made the national team. And then eventually I went on to compete in two Olympics as a long track speed skater. Is it what kind of speed skater? Long track. So there's long oh. track and short track. I did the long track. So it's a very awesome. yeah, popular worldwide sport. Not as well known here, but definitely known now that we've had Olympics both in Canada and the U.S. a few times. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So so you know how to do things long term. That, yeah. That's some dedication. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And then I went on to multiple other careers, but also had a family. And I have two boys, both of whom are elite athletes, and both who are in their teens right now. One's a young adult. And through their journey, um, it started with my oldest one who had a lot of health issues and allergies specifically. And back when he was little, there was very little support for that. And so I ended up starting a company around nutrition in order to help him with his health challenges and transformed our entire family's lives. One thing led to another. And my second child, who also had some issues with food, had some different issues. And his were more in the realm of anxiety and mental health. And it was an on again, off again challenge for many years until he reached grade five when he stopped going to school altogether. Ooh. Yeah. And so we spent a year where I ended up having to, uh, we tried everything with the school. We talked to the principals and the counselors and he literally would not go to school. This dragged out over a year. It was almost a year and a half. Uh, we worked with a pediatrician who eventually got some testing for us um, and we got a diagnosis and still with a full triple diagnosis, they call it. So a learning disability and anxiety disorder and giftedness all in one. Whoa, uh, whoa, we whoa. Had... Wait, wait, wait. unpack that, just pause. <laughs> you just said three things all together that most people don't think of together. Yeah. So, say that. so we call, this, this goes into the realm of neurodiverse. There are a lot of children that fall into this category now and people like adults. Neurodiverse is where um, this triple, they call it thrice gifted, means they have giftedness. So their IQ is very high in at least one area, usually multiple areas. And what a lot of people don't know is when you measure IQ, there are a whole bunch of different facets of IQ. 
And wow. so typically it's not across the board, although it can be, it's key areas where they're off the charts gifted and then other areas where they might be more normal or above average, but not gifted. And for them, that creates this gap. So if you, if everything just occurs to you completely natural with ease and no effort in one realm, and then you go to try to like, just say math, for example, we'll just pick something simple that people can relate to. And then you go over to something like social studies or humanities, and you actually have to work at it. And maybe you're even above average intelligence there, but your brain doesn't operate the same way. So for that person, they actually feel like they have a disability because the difference is so extreme and they don't know how to regulate that in their own mind. So that often creates a learning disability in and of itself. And that's just one example. There are many ways this can occur. Um, that's actually how it occurs for my son. And, and then coupled with all of this, just in the way his brain works and his advanced thinking in some realms, but then his, the, the social maturity, the intellectual maturity sometimes doesn't match and this can create extreme anxiety. Again, just one little piece of a much bigger puzzle. So he had um, a, a full anxiety disorder, a giftedness, and a learning disability. Wow. All coupled in together, and they're all related and associated. Now, to other people's view, he was a completely normal, healthy child with nothing going on. And in fact, in his diagnosis, he could not let other people see that he was having a struggle. That was, it's actually coupled in the condition that he has. You know, that's a thing that is really common. Yes. We don't want people to see what we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. So, okay, wow. Big challenge because it becomes an invis invisible disability. Mm -hmm. And so when people can see that something is wrong, they'll have a lot more compassion or empathy. Not always, we need to work on that as a society. But <laughs> it's a little. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But in general, at least we can perceive that there's a problem. And this is where mental health becomes such a big challenge because we can't necessarily see that somebody else is suffering. And so the judgments and the expectations and the challenges this puts on that person and the people around them, it can actually worsen the problem massively. Well, so yeah, because it puts you into isolation. Oh, it, and uh, yes, I, you can be surrounded by people and be completely isolated because of how they're responding to the circumstance. So I felt it as a parent and my son, you know, well, let me just say, we got really good at finding closets to hide in, in malls because he needed to have a space where he could have his breakdown and actually communicate with me as opposed to, you know, the whole world. Right. So it was interesting because even with a full report from, uh, a psychologist that does the educational and psychological testing, we went to see a psychologist who was supposed to help deal with the challenge. And they, the response in the first session was, there's nothing wrong with him. Like he doesn't have any I issue or illness. Yeah, that was, that was my first as a parent with my child who, who hadn't gone to school in well over a year. That was the response. Uh, and I was just like, like, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> So really interesting set of challenges. We were fortunate to be able to go on and find somebody else who was more helpful, but something else happened in between those two people okay. that really made the difference. So what happened in between those two people that made a different conversation for your son possible? Well, I was part of a company called UEQ where we were developing um, a game to help people in all areas of health. So not just physical health, but emotional health, uh, physical health, spiritual health, etc. And we got introduced by one of our partners to a element of this he had been developing for a while as a game, Ed Kang, who you know, and he had developed uh, something called com conversational EQ which we have since expanded tremendously. But this was a program for adults. Um, he did use it with his kids, and my son was 11 by this point. Um, his biggest challenge started at age 10. Um, and I went through a weekend introduction to this, and it was a crash course. And it was absolutely amazing just in terms of what it awakened for me. But I came home, and by this point, we had my son in a new school, but he still wasn't attending. It was just a school willing to work with us to try to get him back in. And just to give you a further element of how critical his situation was, his principal had said to me the week before, out of 850 students, he is my most ill. 
he is the one that I am most concerned about. And if he had a physical illness, he would be in the hospital medicated, but it's not. And so we can't do that. So this principal was very willing to help, but it kind of gives you perspective. So I came home after this weekend and I had the game in hand and it's, it's a card game, like, like think physical cards, right? And I went through and my son was 11, so I adapted the game a bit, but two things happened. One is I pulled the cards out and he began to talk about emotions. And I was able to use the cards to help him regulate emotion, probably like properly and probably for the first time in his life. Because I, as a parent, I, we did it accidentally. We did it well sometimes, but certainly never consciously or intentionally. I didn't understand that dynamic. What does regulate emotion actually mean? Well, let me give you an example to help you understand it. If we um, are walking down the street and we see a dog just jump out snarling and barking, our immediate response is going to be fear without even thinking about it. You know, there's danger present. We need to run away or we need to defend ourselves somehow. Now the left brain, left side of the brain might catch up and go, you know what, something's wrong with this dog and I'm confident with dogs so I can go and deal with this or I'm terrified of dogs. I need to run and hide. So there is sort of a left and a right brain response. Now when my child was feeling terror, going to school and he literally felt terror about going into the classroom. Um, he would feel that but not be able to name it. He didn't know what he was feeling. Just that I can't go, I have a stomach ache. So that emotion then kind of just collapsed in the brain and I didn't know how to respond or help him with this. So that emotion would just get stuck and it would overwhelm him and he would go into his hind brain, into his amygdala and he would just be like in this fight, flight or freeze state. Freeze is I don't want to go to school. Fight is I'm going to get really mad and yell and I'm going to behave badly so that I can let you know I don't want to go to school, right? Mm -hmm. And he couldn't articulate what he was feeling. And then he, couldn't, he also couldn't tell me what he was thinking to go along with that. So there's a thought and a feeling. And we need to regulate both by acknowledging them and stating them. And then we can, the, the emotion is no longer stuck. We get into our prefrontal cortex to be able to name it and say it and say what we're thinking. And all of a sudden we're in our higher thinking and our higher functioning and now we can problem solve. We're not trapped. In Got a it. Okay. Regulating emotion. I love the way you moved it through the brain. But yes. the reality is regulating emotion is being able to feel the emotion, recognize what you're thinking it's going on at the same time, and then be able to come into problem solving. How do you want to move through this? Or how can you move through this? Yeah. Um, and so there's an action that follows it. And in fact, sometimes you'll go into problem solving. Other times, just going through that process of identifying the emotion, like actually being able to name it, and then consciously um, notice what you're thinking, you don't even need to problem solve. You can now move forward right? Um, if there's a problem to solve, you'll be able to get there. But often that was the problem. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> well, I, all right. So you know, this was my language when I was a stress management consultant. And by the way, if you're in business, it's never a good idea to name your business after the problem you saw. Ah, um, yeah, because I, my company was stress management consult, stress management services, because I had a whole basket under there people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to manage something they don't right. want. So right. uncomfortable emotions, any emotion that pulls your energy down, the ability to have the experience without getting hijacked by it, not being hijacked by your amygdala, exactly. which is the language I used to use. Now we just say, hey, so you don't have a knee-jerk reaction. You can actually have a, a response. Yeah, hijacking is a perfect word. Your brain literally gets hijacked. With kids, I often use the words, the brain is locked. They can't learn anything when they're in that state. You, you can try as a parent or a teacher to teach them mm -hmm. anything, but they're not able to absorb it. Yeah. You know, I, I liken it to arguing with someone who's inebriated. You know, yeah. you, you're not going to be able to help somebody in that state because their brain is not available. The right. same true with being literally intoxicated for having your brain flooded with um, um, adrenaline. Yes, you know? exactly. It's exactly. the exact same thing. Don't argue with them. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> so this is what I was able to do was come home and just using some cards. So he had a visual cue of an emotion and because, you know, he's 11. And of course, I didn't have the, the training prior to that to help him build his emotional vocabulary to be able to identify what are those emotions. Mm -hmm. And if we just think about that for a second, 
there are over 300 emotions that we typically would experience in a day, maybe more. There's like 30,000 in the English language. But on average, in a week, people use 12 to describe how they feel. Okay. This is now, the vocabulary lesson of the day. Yes. 30,000 possible words to describe emotion. 300 commonly used. Uh, well, commonly experienced. Commonly experienced. Thank you. Okay. So 30,000 possible words and emotions, 300 commonly experienced, and yet our vocabulary is condensed down to about 12. Yes. And we wonder why we struggle. Yes. And you can equate this to trying to describe your world in that many colors. Like if I look out my window here, I can see probably eight shades of green, green alone right? Mm -hmm. So describe your emotions. And most adults, even if you ask them, what are you feeling? They can only come up with a couple of words. And, and most of those are probably only touching on what they're actually experiencing. Got right? it. Yeah. So shades of green in, if you're looking at trees, shades of emotion, if your experience is, yeah. well, it, it, led, it lends to a richness of yes. life. Yes. You know, yes. Life gets more interesting. It uh, does. I, you know, at least that's what's been true for my family since I met you. Um, so, okay. So let's, let's talk about, let's play. Let's do something fun. Okay. So there is a, um, do you want to see which game would you like to see? I'll let you choose a kid's game or the one that I tried with my son, even though it's an adult's game. Which one would you like? Um, you know, okay. We're going to let people vote. If you want the kid's game, keep your hand down. If you want the adult game, raise your hand. And that way we'll have an easy yes or no. So we've got... Um, I'm seeing votes coming in. Uh oh. All right. It looks like we have kids game. Okay, great. So there's a, and as I'm pulling this up, there's an additional side to this, which is one learning to regulate the emotions, but the other side is making space for people to share their emotions and their thoughts. So as a parent, I thought I needed to correct what he was experiencing. So I got to make sure I get the right screen here. Oh, got one. it. Um, I thought I needed to fix what he was experiencing, which was completely not true. What I needed to do was to be able to hear what he was experiencing and let him express that. Those two things created a dramatic turnaround for him. So to play this game, uh, well, just quickly show, oh, nope, I'm maybe not going to show you. Okay, so we've got, do you want to pick a number between two and 41, please? I will pick a number between two and 41. And today the number is seven. Okay. And if you raise your hand and you want to play, the first person who raises their hand is going to get to play. All, All right. right. Okay. Now, can you please describe to me what do you see here? Well, I see the number six or the word six, right side up and upside down at each end of the card. I see what appears to be a leaf um, and it's gold and brown and orangey a little bit. Okay, how would it feel if you touched it? Um, looks like it would feel a little bumpy. Wonderful. Okay, now can you read the two words at the top, please? Secure, <laughs> security. Hmm. May I ask you a question, Jackie? Yes. What makes you feel insecure? Ooh, darn. I was reading the card going, oh, I'm all ready for this. Okay, so what <laughs> makes me feel insecure? Oh, well, um, having to rely on technology this week around this show, actually, I had a lot of feelings of insecurity going on. <laughs> Oh my, I can relate to that for sure. And what else makes you feel insecure? Uh, what else makes me feel insecure? Um, hmm. Not having uh, consistent communication. I feel insecure. There we go. I'll put it into a sentence. I feel insecure when I've gone for what feels like a long period of time without talking to my kids who are now in their late 30s and 40s. I can understand that for sure. Okay, how would you like to proceed with the next card? Would you like to have somebody play it? Or would you like well, me to? You know, I've, I offered for somebody to raise their hand and we have some shy people because they didn't know what was coming. What I'd like to do is actually 
have, if, if nobody raises their hand, we'll go ahead, I'll pick another number and I will go this time with 27. Okay, whoops, bear with me. Sorry, that went in the chat, not here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, tell me uh, what do you, what picture and number do you see here? I see 26, both right side up and upside down, which is a little bit surprising because it does 26 and 27 are different. So it's gold, mostly golden yellow and brown. And I see a, a pattern, uh, maybe flowers and leaves or something on the borders. And what do you think it could be? Ooh, um, I'm gonna let people put guesses in the chat box. What could that be? Um, it doesn't, I guess like a door, no. Um, a book, okay, could be a book. I like that answer, that, that's better than what I was coming up with. Um, uh, let's see, all right, so the consensus seems to be book cover. I'm going maybe wall fresco. Mm, nice, I like that too. We've got tile and ceramics in there, very yeah. good. So how would it feel if you touched it? How would it feel if you touched it? Well, it would depend on where I touched it because the, the bars look to be smooth. Um, the center panel looks like it would be like rough, a little rougher. Mm -hmm. And of course, where it looks like it's carved and got you know all the designs, that would be really different to, to touch because it would not be smooth at all. Excellent. Okay, all right, if this works here, there we go. <coughs> um, now, do you, can you read the two words at the top of the, the uh, card, please? Forceful and forced. Now, at this point, if you're working with kids, you can actually talk about what these words mean. You can look them up online. We have an emotions dictionary. So this is a really great space to open up questions and help them understand examples of where this could occur. The questions are also going to help them understand as we give examples. So do you mind if I ask you a question, Jackie? No, I don't mind if you ask me a question. If you feel forced to do something, how could you respond properly? Mm, properly. Boy, now that's an important word in that sentence. Because if we didn't put that word in there, the answer might be different. If I feel forced to do that, how could I respond properly? Um, I guess properly would be to pause, acknowledge, you know, and let them know, I feel forced. Was that your intention? I might ask. Um, that would be my idea of sort of a proper response. My initial response without that word properly was dig my heels in. You know, there's some mule in my family. We are not pure blood, but we do have some. So my first response was to dig my heels in. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it really does change it when we add that component. Oh, my goodness. It, it changed it a lot for my brain because otherwise I'm this little kid going, you can't make me. Yeah. <laughs> So this is actually perfect because this touches on this other concept that we need to help parents and, and anybody learning EQ learn about. It's a very complex topic, but it's called corrective complex. Mm. So the very simple way to understand it is corrective complex is this um, <clears throat> desire to fix, heal, convert, direct, or teach other people. It's when we see that they or we hear they have a problem and we have a solution and we got to jump in there and we got to tell them right away. So as a parent with my son, when he was feeling terrified about going to school, I actually thought as a parent, my job was to make him feel better. It was to make that terror go away. So I try to help him see the bright side, the good things, tell him how else he could feel. And none of that acknowledged what he was experiencing. And so what we need to do is give space to allow people to feel and think what they think, hear it. You don't have to agree with it, but you hear it and you allow it. And when they need time to come up with their answer, like if I asked a, a child this question, they might take a little longer to answer than you, right? And we have to give that space for them to answer and not give them examples of when they've seen it or, or experienced it, but let them come up with their answer. Then you can share back and forth. But what happens if we don't do that, if we just jump in, like using this is perfect, if I jump in and try to force you to think something or to do something, your knee-jerk reaction is to go the other direction to say no, or even to do the opposite. And so when we recognize and step out of corrective complex, we allow people 
to begin to collaborate with us and to be open to what we're asking about. So in this case, using that word respond properly, okay, let's step out of that reaction. Let's try to collaborate around this. It's a great example, Michelle. And I'm just, I, while the card's still up, I'm just going to, I was, I was gonna take us on a slight journey. Yep. And my brain is saying, no, I guess you're not. Cause that thought, that train oh. left the station without <laughs> me. Um, Oh no, I got it. It was about sales because what some people don't know is that my background is in helping entrepreneurs learn how to sell themselves on themselves so that they never had to sell anybody else. So that's what I call sales from the inside out. And what would often happen when I was working with people on sales conversations is that they would, in listening to somebody talk to them and describe a problem, they would do exactly what you call corrective complex, what I call fire hose. Mm -hmm. They would go in and immediately start talking about all the different ways their product or service could solve the problem, which totally bypassed this space of being present to how the other person is feeling. And people don't buy because of logic. They buy because of how they feel, the emotional component. So for anyone who thinks this is a kid's game and it's just about regulating emotion, this is a huge, huge component of how to be successful in life. You become more successful in every area of life when you can start meeting people where they are emotionally rather than trying to <clears throat> force them to come into your world and see things your way. So powerful yeah. word, thank you. Powerful, and you know, you've, you've touched on something else here. This game, this one that we're playing right now, it's one of seven levels that we have for children. And we have many adults going through it from a training perspective, and they're actually having to slow themselves down because it's creating such transformation in their lives. And they haven't even reached our adult program yet. So this program is a really gentle way for parents or any adult who really wants to go back through the basics of how our brain develops from an emotional intelligence perspective and let yourself get the gentle version before you go in full bore into the adult. Like, okay, <laughs> let's go, here we are. <laughs> so, and and it, gives you, it gives you some really interesting things. It gives you a lot of structure and strategy around how to converse on these mm-hmm. topics. And it's not the only way, not by a long shot, but it gives you a foundation and it can make the journey a lot softer and easier. Yeah, well, and the experience that I've had since finding you all and and hooking up and starting to get the, the fact that these games even existed and the concepts behind them. I mean, I'm gonna be blunt, all right? This is Jackie. I've got this set of cards for kids and I've got deck one next to my book that I read every morning in my journal. And I start my day now with going through about half a dozen cards in level one. I love that. Just giving myself this experience because there's some uh, gaps in my emotional education. And this was um, something that I love doing to, to help people understand that when you're raised in an environment, whatever environment you were raised in, the odds are that there were 12 major words, consistent words used for emotion, and the rest of them were ignored because there wasn't language. And so starting this whole journey, I just decided I'm, you know, I'm going to start at the very beginning. You know, I mean, I'm a fan of um, yeah. classics like the Sound of Music. Classic musicals is how I raised my kids. And so that song, let's start at the very beginning. Yes. So yeah, you guys have done just an awesome job putting all of this together. So, all right. Can I address address a comment on the side here? Yeah, absolutely. We can absolutely do that. So Amy just commented light bulb moment um, within the endo women's health world, practitioners versus patients. We don't or haven't made the space. And this is so true. And I experienced this as a nutritionist myself. I didn't understand why I was able to help so many people so well. And then other people I just completely offended and pushed away 
because we jump in, and this is corrective complex, we jump in and we say, well, because I know what will make you feel better, I have to tell you, and we forget to ask permission, which is exactly what we're doing on these cards. Do you mind if I share something? Do you mind if I ask you something? And you know what, if they say no, it's not about you, it's about the fact that right now that's not gonna work for them, right? It's about All your ability to receive. Yeah. <laughs> This is cool because it is a piece of the conversation, whether you're in the healing arts or whether you're an entrepreneur, you know, no matter where you're interacting with other people, what we used to call common courtesies somehow got lost in translation. This yeah. concept of asking permission before you give someone an opinion. Yes. And I'm, I can only teach what I've learned, which is why I'm so good at teaching all about these things like self-sabotage and sales. Yeah, because yes. I lived it. Exactly. And, and that's where we all come from, life experience. Yeah, life experience. So I still want to see card 27. Okay. Uh, I think that what, this was card 27, actually. This so says 26. I know. They don't align perfectly because we're on the digital deck. <laughs> I want to see 27. All right. Hold up. <laughs> there we go oops let me go back a second here okay so uh what number <laughs> do you see i was gonna say did what we just do come under the heading of corrective complex which one of us was correcting each other? Uh, it's all good it's all good <laughs> sometimes just just conversation <laughs> it's all good and the the idea is that this is fun Yes. When you let this be fun, when you take being right out of the conversation, yes. then you can just show up and play. So here we go. 27, upside down and right side up. And um, I see something that could be dried mud. So what is it really? It is brownish um, model something. Okay. Let, let's see what our audio, oh yes, we got like, I'd love to see the guests put up what they think it could be too. <laughs> it's an interesting picture. There we go, okay. it's an interesting picture. Okay, chat away people. What do you think this picture of? Oh, oh wait a minute, I'm gonna make it where they can see it a little bigger because I know they're seeing, there we go. I hope that makes it bigger. Somebody said dried mud or poop. Ooh, a cookie. That's an interesting interpretation. Ooh, now I'm hungry. Okay, so dry clay and mud are the two more uh, common answers coming up. Okay. Yeah. Now, how would it feel if you touched it? Well, dry, there we go. It would be dry, um, it would have ridges in it. Um, since somebody said poop, I'm going, I hope it's dry, maybe I won't touch it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hard, yeah. For yeah. sure. Oh, look at this. A lot of good words coming up. We got uh, flaky and hard. Okay, yeah. good words. I like that. Exactly. Okay, can you read the two words on the top? Mistreated, mistreatment. Okay. So, uh, do you have a moment for a question, Jackie? Yes, I do. Um, how do you think you might have mistreated others before? Interrupting is the first word that came to my mind. This not only not asking for permission to talk, but talking over. Yes. I just somehow decided that that would qualify under the label of mistreatment. For sure. And, you know, to, to touch on this a little further, the um, emotional intelligence skills are caught, not taught. So we can learn them, which is beautiful and fantastic. But what we have for our current skills is what we have learned just through our upbringing, from mostly from our parents, but also from our extended families, coaches, teachers that we spend a lot of time with growing up. And so there's, when you talk about not being right and wrong, that's, it's so beautiful because we want to make space for the fact that somebody may not know yet or may not be aware or may not have had the opportunity to develop the skill differently. And that's what we get to do when we come at it from a collaborative approach. Got it. So um, what else, uh, like where else do you think you might have mistreated others before? Where else might I have mistreated others before? Um, yeah, that, that, yeah, we did, that other one is like 
elephant wand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm there. I'm with you. Yeah. So <laughs> where else might I have mistreated others? Um, I'm, yeah, that's the biggest one is just not pausing, not being present to oh. listen without problem solving. Yeah. And for, for those who have been following me, um, I, they did a, a sort of a personality test with me on live on my own show, which was kind yeah. of interesting. <laughs> and they gave me a label of I'm a problem solver. Right. And it said, it's not going to change. Yeah, so my tendency is going to be to solve your problem, whether or not I have your permission. So this pause to ask permission is what I've been seeking. Um, it's actually um, what I've been seeking for a long time. I said I needed a pause button, and this was something that took me on a journey for and landed me in my current career, right. was looking for the things that would help me what you call emotional regulation. I call having a pause button. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's the closest I've come to actually being able to understand the, the language. Um, let's see. What was I going to tell you? Um, and so you don't have to worry about the chat because I got that. That's happening um, behind the scenes because we've got team. Yes. All right, where have I mistreated others? I mistreated my whole audience speaker experience when I did a summit without team because it was a very different experience. Wow. Yes. So while I was showing up and I was delivering and the summit was happening, the fact that the experience is so different now, I realized that that was actually mistreating both my audience and my speakers. That makes sense. I totally get that and I can relate. Yeah. We don't know what we don't know, but team helps. <laughs> yes. So on that topic, can we circle it back to the, um, the purpose of your show this weekend for a moment? Sure. So I can recall many times where I've been with people who are in that space of feeling suicidal. And one of the things that I didn't know in years past, sometimes I was very successful in helping people. Other times I was less effective than I would have liked to have been in a conversation with them. And so thinking about this pause is really key. You know, what am I thinking and why am I talking? We call that wait, right? Ah. So it's a way to create that pause for yourself is wait. What am I thinking? Why am I talking? And I think back to the times when those conversations have not been as effective as I want to be. And it's because what I'm thinking is I have to make them feel better. Same thing I did with my son when he was in his anxiety. I think I have to make them feel better. Now, I, needed, I didn't know. I absolutely didn't know that that was not going to help them. <laughs> right. But yeah. even having that pause of, you know, what am I thinking and why am I talking? I'm talking because I think this is what they need. Well, is it actually what they need? And I can ask myself that question. And so when we combine these techniques, which we learn through each of the games, now we can completely, whether you have the skill around a topic or not, you can transform a confirmation, a conversation you have with somebody by taking that pause. And, and again, we use the acronym wait just to, because when you say wait and you go, okay, and you have to figure out, what does that stand for? So why am I talking? What am I thinking? You're uh, actually yeah. pausing your brain, right? And you're processing, and then you can go into the next steps of, you know, okay, so what are you feeling? What, what's the thought you have going on? Don't try to fix their thought. Just allow their thought to be. Maybe they just need to be heard. Don't try to fix it. What a concept. Um, you know, it absolutely goes against the, what they told me to expect for my mind type. You know, it's, um, and so I have to be really mindful of this. Yes. And I think you've hit upon something super, super profound, that the damage we inadvertently do when we don't give the space for people, when we're trying to fix them. Yes. Yeah, um, that's pretty profound. And yeah, let's, let's give each other some space here. So you remember when you said at the beginning, like when we get into that prefrontal cortex, then we can solve the problem. And that may be the next step, but often, um, or maybe equally, I mean, I don't know the percentage, but there is a lot of times when just by them being heard and being able to fully express that, there is no more problem to solve. 
They just simply need to process the emotion and then something new occurs in its place. Yeah, now there was some chat about that, which I absolutely love. Um, so I'm just going to put it out there that um, this is a really important conversation. Sometimes just expressing the emotion is enough. Yes. So we're going to stick with that. I love it. What else are we going to talk about today? Okay. Do you want to try another game or do you want to do some more in this card? Would you like to... So, you know, I'm going to say let's try another game because I think that this is an important one. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just grab one here. So we just, oops. Close this one. Um, now we have a choice again, the adults game. Uh, we have our race empathy or uh, another um, child race, game at a higher race level. Empathy. Okay. okay. Race empathy, because this whole conversation about empathy is one that um, it comes up a lot in my world. So let's play with that one. Okay, so this game is ages 13 and up. And here's what this game is designed to help with. Empathy by relating to experiencing experience, expanding root emotions, asking permissions, which we just did. Oh, you know what? I think I might have just, let me check here. I think I might have just pulled out the same game. I did. I'll, I'm going to switch this. I'm sorry. That's okay. It says race to empathy at the top of that card, but it, it does, but it was the well. same skills that we just did. So I'll just pull a different one here. Yeah, it's okay. And I'm going to invite you out of your teaching mode because I know you work with all of the tutors and you're very engaged in this certification. And, and so let's, uh, let's just have some fun with this, with everybody who's on. So I want people, if you would like to play, Go ahead and raise your hand, and so then I will call on you, and you can have them. We're going to have time for about one or two cards at the most, so just you know, pop your hands up, and we'll catch up with you. But before we do that, I want to give people the link to get your gift, because what is so cool about this is that the gift you have for them is Emotional Intelligence Guide and a mini course. So yes. that's, that includes that Dictionary of Emotions, right? So anybody, yes, it does. Yeah, it, anybody who thought that there was something funky going on with that level of how many emotions and stuff, then this is really key. You're going to love, I, I loved it. It's what got me started on this whole journey. So I was super happy that you brought that. Okay. So I'm putting it into the chat right now. And there we go. And for some reason, the link is not showing up as a hyperlink, but we'll get it fixed for you. Um, I know why. Ugh. Don't we love the new rules of Zoom? Okay. I know, it's it's people. I got to get Zoom to behave. Let's try that. Bum, 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 bum. And the winner is, it's still not showing up with the hyperlink. Okay. Guys, just copy and paste. It's a bit.ly and then it's TSPS10 because you're on this show. And so that's something that you all can easily hear if you're listening to this on the podcast B-I-T dot L-Y, that's a bit.ly, forward slash T-S-P-S, like the abbreviation for teaspoons, and then the number 10. So there we go. It's in the chat. Grab a hold of it. Thank you. What are we doing? Tell me more. about that description. Okay. Pick a number between 2 and 41. 2 and 41. Uh, we'll go with 37. Okay. All right. Can you tell me, uh, what do you see here? I see somebody with a neck issue. <laughs> no, I see a woman who's smiling and she's got long hair and she's making a heart sign with her hands and she's wearing a yellow sweater and she's standing against a yellow background. All right. Now, how can you relate? What well, way her, you her smile makes me want to smile. Okay, perfect. All right, so the next thing we're going to do, and we'll both do this, and anybody who's watching should do this at the same time. We're going to copy the picture, okay? All right. One, two. Hearts three. up. All right, perfect. This always gets everybody giggling. Okay, <laughs> now, how does it feel when you do that, when you copy that picture? How does it feel? You know, it, it's just a fun thing. It's just, uh, so it feels fun. Okay. There we go. What emotion would you put to it? I know fun is, is, is a result. Like, 
But ah, we'll talk about that for you. There we go. Okay, so fun is a result. So the emotion, um, I, I'm looking at the chat and getting ideas. Okay, so giddy. Um, yeah, the, the emotion is happy. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, now, can you use this picture and tell a story, just a short story, either your own experience or what you think she could be experiencing? Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, tell a story about my own experience and what she could be experiencing. She's obvious to me. She's experiencing being in a relationship with someone. She's sending them a picture of herself. You know, it's just like, I'm good. You're good. I love you. Yeah. Perfect. That's excellent. Okay, can you read the emotion word and the definition below it, please? That's in the middle. Okay, so the big word in the middle is aware. I did aware as an emotion? Huh, okay. Add it to my emotional dictionary. Okay, aware. You have knowledge and perception about something. So these aren't necessarily just like core emotions, but concepts around emotional intelligence as well. Got it. All right, well, I certainly, we've been talking this morning about awareness is the key to everything, and it is certainly the key to change. So I love the fact that that's what came up on the card. Yes, the universe has my back. Perfect. Okay, now can you just say and complete the sentence on the bottom? I am becoming more aware of how I feel. There we go. Very good. Yeah. Okay, now we can choose to expand that in any given card and say, so what does that look like for you? How is that showing up? You're welcome to answer that, or we can go on to another card. All right, so um, I'm becoming more aware of how I feel and how that's showing up. Is that, um, actually, I realized that the more I start playing with the cards, becoming aware of how I feel about things, my decisions are changing. What I choose to spend my time doing that's is changing. Fun. Yeah, it's like, Oh, well, that was easy. You know, I just, change happened. It wasn't a struggle, which for some of us who <clears throat> are resistant to change, um, not that I have any, you know, um, highly developed <laughs> control tendencies or anything like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was easy. So, uh, yeah, so thank you. That's the story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> perfect. Okay, do you want to do one more card? Yeah, let's do one more. All okay. right. Pick a number. Um, pick a number. We're going to go with 11. Oh, goodness, went in the chat again. Sorry. Computers. There you okay. Go. Oh. <laughs> okay, describe to me what you see. I see someone showing off their teeth, um, mm -hmm. actually, because their eyes are crinkled. I see someone smiling really big, making sure that everybody can see that she's smiling. Now, when might you see this? When might I see this? Um, yeah, well, I could certainly see it on an improv stage. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Very cool. I like that. And else might I see this would be, um, uh, you know, I'm like family reunion. See, I'm happy, you know. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, and that kind of touches on how can you relate? Yeah. Kind of. Family, uh, family reunion experience case, right? Yeah. I'm trying to get this. There we go. Somebody said just got her braces off. So they went right to the story. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Before we go to the rest of the story, let's just copy the picture. And when you do this, I want you to think about how do you feel? All okay. right. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what emotion does this evoke? Yeah, you know, somewhere between giggly, um, happy. Um, there's a the kind of a a, a a proud. Ah, very good. Okay, so you had the story about the braces. Anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's perfect. <laughs> I think like that one. That is kind of what you would see after that. Okay, yeah. now can you read the word and the definition in the middle? Ooh, grouchy. You feel irritable, grumpy, and want to complain. Hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's, I think, pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, that's a great definition of grouchy. It is. It is. Now, can you read the sentence and complete it on the bottom? I feel grouchy when... Mm, well, I feel grouchy when my tech doesn't work. Um, 
Right, for anybody running any kind of business event, my landing page stopped talking to my customer relationship management software. So people registering for the show were not getting the emails that said, thank you for registering for the show. So I was grumpy and I wanted to complain. There just wasn't anybody really to complain to except my team. And so thank God I have team that is tolerant. Um, so big shout out to Catherine Richlaud and Katie Miller, to the people who have been supporting me through the, what I call the tech tangle tango. Cause trust me in the background, we've been dancing. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, yes. so I was feeling very grouchy then. It's a funny story now. Yeah. <laughs> I can fully relate. I will just say technology definitely makes me grumpy. All right, so I'm going to pop back up here and grab that link that's misbehaving. We'll try it one more time um, and just pop this into the chat so that you guys can copy it. Because this particular, you know, intro course and the emotional dictionary is so much fun and it's such an easy way to start a conversation that truly matters. Mm -hmm. You know, when you can start talking about emotions, emotions no longer control you. And that's really the gift of this, is when you can start having conversation, especially when it's fun, around emotion, and emotions no longer control you, you actually can shift into a place where maybe you feel like you got a little control over your emotion. <laughs> kind of a fun place to be. It's a great analogy for sure. So there we go. All right. So, Michelle, thank you so much for being willing to come on the show and share with us your journey and your son's journey. Now, the one thing you didn't do was close the loop. You said you played the game with your son. How oh. many times, how long, what did you actually do with your son and what happened? So it was the adult game, which just has, I feel and I think and an emotion. So I pulled out the cards and we played it for about 10 minutes, three times the first day. So three 10 minute sessions. And we worked through words that he understood. And I pulled ones that I knew were kind of relevant to what he might be experiencing at the time, given his age. And he did the, I feel and I think with me. And the next day he went to school for the first time, left the house, went in the school doors, got into his classroom and stayed there without any breakdowns for the first time in a year and a half. And he was able to spend about two hours in class that day. Within two weeks, he did his first full day at school. And within a month, he was going to school uh, full time, no problems at all. And that was expected to not even be achievable, let alone in the next year to year and a half based on the traditional psychology and diagnosis that he had. That's really amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really amazing. Profound. So, yeah, so huge, huge shift. That's what's possible when you actually are willing to have the conversation and go on the journey. So Michelle, thank you for going on this journey with thank me. Thank you for having me. I love having your cards come into my world. <laughs> yeah. oh, so bad. Hey, keep playing them. I love your examples of how you're using them too. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. All right. So that wraps up this journey to this part of our show. Thank you all for being a part of this and stick around. The ride gets more interesting from here.